Let's get more now on uh, Rishi Sunak's address from Number 10 last night, where he warned that rising extremism is putting our democracy at risk. Uh, well, with me now to discuss it is uh, Philip Grindle, who's a former New Scotland Yard detective who set up a team in Parliament responsible for identifying threats against MPs following the assassination of Joe Cox in 2016. Uh, very good morning to you, Philip Grindle. I really appreciate your time this morning. First of all, I, I wonder what your view is more broadly, aside from the security of MPs, which we'll come on to, more broadly about the Prime Minister making a speech like this? Do you think it was needed? Do you welcome the fact that he made it? I think um, it's possibly needed. I think it's a bit too late, personally. I think it should have been the statement made some weeks ago because we've seen the marches and the protests and the demonstrations, etc., from uh, those who are campaigning for Palestine to become increasingly intimidating, increasingly um, targeted at politicians in ways that is going to cause them that level of fear and concern. So I think, I think you know, if it's just initiated by the Rochdale election, that, that's probably slightly worrying, but I, I uh, certainly agree with some of what he said. Well, yes, and he did talk about democracy itself being under threat. He talked a lot about um, individuals, uh, you know, living in our communities. He talked about uh, abuse of Muslim Britons as well as the Jewish community as well. But when he's talking about democracy under threat, uh, we have heard a lot in recent weeks about some MPs feeling threatened, and you've got a lot of experience, as we outlined in our introduction, in this area. Uh, are they right to be worried, or do you feel that there are now sufficient protections in place? Well, I think what we need to do is, is understand the threat against them. So what we are seeing and what we saw, certainly when I was there during the, the kind of toxic years of Brexit voting, which is kind of similar to now in terms of the, the intimidation, the way in which MPs are being targeted, etc., is that those people who abuse, threaten and intimidate uh, politicians and other public figures do so in order to do exactly that, to cause fear, to cause that intimidation. They are not in any way indicating that they are going to attack or they are going to cause a physical threat. However, what happens is, is that certainly members of parliament become increasingly paranoid and some at the extremes will become increasingly hypervigilant around the threat that they fear they are under. We've heard, or I've certainly read and heard in the last few days and weeks about politicians in fear about going around their daily lives in terms of going shopping, you know, getting a train, doing their normal business. And that's, that fear is understandable because they're scared of being confronted and shouted at and sworn at and intimidated. And, and we've seen some sort of criminal damage to their, to their properties and to their constituency offices, et cetera. So all that is entirely understandable in terms of the fear that they're experiencing. But that is the intention of those people who are doing that. That's quite different to the scenario that we've seen previously with David Amos and Joe Cox and others, and Rosie Cooper as well. So we need to separate the two, and we need to make sure that what we're not doing is judging someone's risk and threat by the amount of abuse, etc., that they're receiving. And what do you think the impact of a speech can have on calming down tensions. I mean, it was clearly an, an impassive speech from uh, Rishi Sunak, but he didn't announce any new policies or action, for example. So do you think that words can make a difference? I don't think what he said will have any impact on those protest groups. I think what, we're, what, we're, what we've seen over the last few years, I think, is the protest groups becoming increasingly militant. There will be thousands of ordinary people who are participating lawfully and peacefully in all of these various protests, be it the Palestine, be it the, the environmental ones, etc. But what we are seeing is the increasing militant aspect of those demonstrations, where um, it really is irrelevant what you think, it's only their voice that counts. And what we need to do is reflect back to the early days of the animal liberation front and all those sort of movements, where the very tactics we're seeing is exactly what they practised when they were targeting uh, business leaders and others that were involved in the animal liberation um, protest groups, where in actual fact they became terrorists. And we saw cars being, you know, bombs put on cars, people being properly threatened, people being attacked. And we need to sort of differentiate the two. But what we are seeing is that more militant side of the protest groups. 
um, they won't they won't give a jot what the prime minister or anyone else says. In, in their view, they're right. What they're doing is is um, their 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 aims justify the means justify the aims. They will carry on as normal, and in many ways, it might even embolden some of them. What's going to be interesting is the difference in policing tactics, because what traditionally has happened, and I'm not just for the record, I'm not a public order uh, specialist in terms of policing, but what we have seen is the police standing back and gathering evidence and then going and arresting later. And they do that for good reason. They do that because if they get involved there and then, what actually generally happens is you create a more aggressive, volatile scenario and you end up in sort of scuffles and fights and all sorts of things. And it often aggravates and escalates the violence. So what they've done is taken that tactic to step back, evidence gather, film, video, and then arrest later. The problem with that is it appears to the public that people who are breaking the law are getting away with it. And so it emboldens people to do that. They're not fearful of their actions. And then when we see people going to court and being convicted under the Terrorism Act, they get released anyway. So, you know, there's no kind of stick around this. It's all carrot. Interesting, interesting stuff. Um, Philip Grindle, we appreciate your time. Thanks very much indeed for sharing your take on, on the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.